Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Marketing Analytics. Uh, we're going to continue our introductory discussion uh, about marketing analytics today. And what we're going to cover here is just trying to focus on understanding a few key definitions of terms that are commonly uttered when we think about marketing analytics. So let's see if I can add a little more clarity to how these uh, terms relate to our field of study. So, of course, let's just define it. Like, what is marketing analytics? If you took a pause right now and you fired off a, a Google search for marketing analytics, you would definitely find several different definitions. Uh, so let's actually talk about that there's these lots of different definitions for marketing analytics. Uh, not to mention, when people utter this phrase in your working world, uh, you'll find out that they often have their own idiosyncratic understanding of this term as well. So first off, uh, one term definition that I thought was appropriate uh, is marketing analytics is the practice of managing and studying metrics data in order to determine the ROI of marketing efforts, ROI meaning return on investment, as well as the act of identifying opportunities for improvement. So a common theme that you can see here right away is the idea that we are analyzing data, right? And we're linking that to actual sort of organizational goals. In this case, they're using the word ROI, return on investments, like financials. And of course, the thing that we're un trying to understand of how it relates to profitability or uh, return on investment is marketing efforts, right? The inputs, the things that we as marketers control to try to drive organizational success. Now, honestly, I think this definition is perfectly fine. Lots of um, people might accept this entirely. But I think in practice, we will find that this definition is actually a little too narrow to um, understand what marketing analytics is as a concept in modern times. So first, let's take a look at what I would maybe consider a more broad, maybe the most broad and appropriate still definition of marketing analytics. So that's in the bottom left here. Marketing analytics includes all of the activities and technology used by marketers to derive insights from data, all in service of shaping how marketing is practiced. Now, you'll notice this uh, definition is quite like the one above. You might even want to pause the video and kind of assess on your own uh, the relationship between the two. Uh, now, what I think in this more broad definition is, that is called out right away is that um, we're still talking about insights from data, but we're talking about any activity at all. Um, and any technology at all. So it's a very broad tent of what we might mean about analyzing data. Um, and it's a thing that we're doing. And we say all in service of shaping how marketing is practiced. Well, still embedded in this broader definition, usually when we're trying to shape marketing practice, it is to drive return on investment or profitability. But this broader definition also works well uh, if your organizational goals or immediate or short-term goals in your organization aren't just profit-driven, right? Maybe you're a marketer who the scope of your responsibility at an organization is just to redu uh, reduce the number of customer service calls that come in from upset customers, right? Um, so that might be your goal and how to shape marketing practice. Or maybe you work for a nonprofit where the goal is to reduce uh, the percentage of population in a given area that don't have access to nutritious food, right? That's not necessarily profit driven per se, but it's a goal. Now, what's also true is when you hear people say the phrase marketing analytics out there in the real world, out in your job, what you're often going to find out is that they're not necessarily using these this broad academic -y, um, definition. Usually with a little bit of observation uh, or, or uh, inquisitive uh, evaluation of, their, of their statement, you'll realize that they are thinking of marketing analytics usually in a more context-specific way. What I mean by that is given the organization they work for, given the type of technology or software, and given the type of data that is commonly part of their working world, they, much, they might have a much more narrow understanding of the phrase marketing analytics because it's tailored to the world and career that they're occupy, uh, occupying. So, for example, this is just one of many, many possible context-specific examples, right? So let's say someone said, um, I'm using marketing analytics, but in reality what they meant was they're just using Google Analytics, a particular type of software, to determine which paid placement keywords, a type of marketing activity, had the best click-through rates for a new Google AdWords campaign for our website. So 
if you kind of compare the most broad definition in the more context specific uh, example here, you'll notice that all the elements are still present in the context specific example. They're just more narrowly tailored to that particular um, individual's working world. So out there, when you're out there in the career of, of marketing analytics, uh, you probably will also eventually develop a more context specific understanding of the term given the shape of the world that you live in. Now, there's several other sort of buzzwords, academic-y words, jargony words, or words in the news media that I want to take a moment here to kind of evaluate together. So in this big tent here that is marketing analytics, there's some other terms that sort of, you know, hide within or, or, or oversee them. But in my case, I'm going to kind of put them in it so we can kind of understand where they all fit together. So you might see phrases like data science or computer science and terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data. Now, again, in all instances here, if you fire up you know, a, a YouTube search uh, and look up what the definitions of these terms are for like simple explainers, you might see that some people have sort of a hierarchy of how these different terms are related. Uh, in the, but in the chart that I have here, right, I'm showing that there's a lot of overlap, right? When we say one term in, in the real world, in reality, people sort of mean the other thing or they overlap in some way in their own mind. So that overlap that I have here is intentional, at least in the way that we're going to kind of explore these terms together. And I'll try to identify sort of those intersection points and why there's a bit of blurriness around uh, these terms, despite, you know, of course, the fact that people sometimes just get a little confused when they use them. So. First of all, you know, these terms, I, I hope that these are things that you have sort of just come across in your um, internships, just reading articles on the internet or maybe in other marketing classes. So what we're looking at here is a Google Trends. Uh, so on the X axis here, we have, you know, time, of course. And on the Y axis, we have relative search value for different phrases. So notice it goes up to 100 in the upper right hand corner here for machine learning. Now, the way that Google uh, releases Google Trends data is it never tells you exactly how many searches were done. They kind of keep that proprietary, but they do let you know the relative search volume. So we just know, we don't really know how many people were searching for machine learning uh, in uh, past 2020 here, but we do know it was the most popular. And what I wanted to illustrate for you here in this uh, little simple chart is notice that search for artificial intelligence uh, as a term kind of faded in the early 2010s and kind of it's re, it's re, you know, re, re, uh, emerged a little bit here as we move further into time. But what's taken over the use of the term artificial intelligence? And there's two things. First, in the sort of earlier 2010s, we see this yellow line here. The phrase big data became sort of a hot term here right around till about 2017. And then it became uh, surpassed by the phrase machine learning, right? So these are pretty popular terms and they're now sort of part of our common language, at least in, in marketing. And of course, uh, so let's try to understand them a little better. And I, I guess I should also qualify and say, when I say popular terms, let's be a little relative. So like, for example, when I added the word crypto uh, into this search, we can see that the word crypto overwhelmingly dominated search uh, for quite a few years here, far surpassing those of artificial intelligence, and machine learning and big data. So we can really see that. And notice I also truncated this uh, chart to only look at the last five years, just so we could really see this difference. You could actually generate this chart yourself. And then of course, when I say, you know, relatively speaking, not just crypto, maybe even more recently here, uh, chat GPT, we can see that, you know, of course, popular media, uh, popular common conscious, the zeitgeist, if you will, of, of the online uh, culture. Uh, different terms become sort of popular. Uh, so sure, maybe machine learning isn't quite as popular as some of these other ideas, even though chat GPT is a manifestation of machine learning. And of course, all these things, sure, they're popular, but you know, they're only so relatively popular. I mean, Taylor Swift, uh, with a few other ex few exceptions, uh, completely dominates all this other conversation about these technical terms. So relatively speaking, about the popularity of these phrases. Okay. With that said, let's take a look at what is data science, right? So data science combines math and statistics, uh, specialized programming, advanced analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning with specific subject matter expertise 
to uncover actionable insights hidden in an organization's data. These insights can be used to guide decision making and strategic planning. Uh, at least that's according to IBM uh, 2023. And now, if you pause for a second, think about how I defined marketing analytics previously, and look at this definition of data science. Do you see some commonalities? First, we see this analysis of data. We're adding some more advanced words here, of course. But also this idea of mixing with subject matter expertise, meaning it's not just enough to know how to play around with the data or do fancy stats. You actually have to know how to use that data and that's those insights in relationship to the specific topic and domain that you're working on. Plus being marketers, that means something in the marketing field. And then these insights can be used to guide decision making and strategic planning. Again, what's unique here? We're saying it's not just enough to be an analyst and not just enough to look at data, but data science is we have to take that stuff so that we can give good, honest recommendations about how to actually do things in the real world in a more sensible way, right? So in other words, in many cases, marketing analytics is really sort of data science applied to marketing. Or in practice, that's really what it's turning into, at least. So I often emphasize in our class that we are not data scientists. We are uh, just marketers. But I honestly really just use that because I've learned that the phrase data scientist can be a little intimidating for uh, newer learners in the marketing field. The truth is, no, we are. We are absolutely <laughs> learning to be data scientists, but just, you know, in our own way, specific to the field of marketing. And in other words, you know, another thing that's true about data science or marketing analytics or, or being a data scientist is that, look, you have to be able to wear, and I'm sure you've heard this phrase in other marketing classes, you have to wear multiple different hats to do this job well, right? You not only have to be good at analyzing and understanding data, but you also have to be really good at having subject matter expertise, right? You have to be both at once to succeed in this space. And that's, of course, why uh, profitable, uh, sorry, profitable uh, um, successful careers in marketing analytics uh, it can be so uh, lucrative for many individuals who pursue them because it's difficult to have this type of expertise that straddles two different spaces at once. Now, why are we talking so much about the term big data, right? If you recall back to the Google Trends uh, chart, big data really kind of in the early 2010s, we really started seeing this term becoming much more popular in it at least in terms of online search volume. So again, big data has a lot of different definitions, but I want to focus on the parts that are commonly shared amongst anyone who's taking it serious when we say the phrase big data. So in marketing, big data usually speaks to data that we are looking to analyze that is massive in size. So literally, we might be talking about terabytes or even much larger data sets. So literally, we have to deploy unique methods of storage of the data, access of the data or types of analysis. Like it's hard to analyze ginormous data sets, so we need special techniques. Uh, usually the type of data that is big data is automatically generated. So you might be thinking about like um, websites that are tracking your click behavior that's automatically being generated data, or maybe loyalty card tracking or credit card purchases, right? Once the system is in place, all of the data being captured by those transactions is happening automatically. Now. Conversely, think of something like um, like a focus group, right? You come into a room, someone, a moderator interviews you, and for an hour, you and seven people have a conversation. Now, that's another way of generating data, right? That can be very useful, but it's not automatically generated data, similar to, say, a consumer survey, right? It's not being automatically generated. You, the participant who's taking the survey, is completing and answering those questions. So again, we might use survey data or other types of data as part of marketing analytics, but usually when we use the phrase big data, we're not including that type of information. Another characteristic of so-called big data is when we don't have the data that we want to use all residing from a single common source, meaning maybe the internal data that we've been tracking about our customers is one part of the big data set, but maybe we have a third party provider who we are merging our customer records with other information that that company has that's selling this information about our 
potential or current customers, and we're integrating it together. And maybe we're further blending that data with U.S. census data. This would be an example of uh, another challenge associated with big data where we're trying to pull from multiple different sources and then use it all at once. The data in when we're talking about big data also is, well, the individual records themselves are usually not big in size. They tend to be very granular. And by very granular, I mean like a tiny, tiny, tiny little grain of sand. We're drilling very, very, very far down. So again, when I mean granular, an example of granular data would be, I know the exact time, the exact place, the exact click, an exact person did somewhere on amazon.com very, very fine, precise data at a very small level, rather than just knowing um, how many different pages a particular customer went to on Amazon in a month. That would be more coarse data, more aggregated. So when we're dealing with big data, it's really drilled down at a very small level. This all boils down to understanding that there's really three V's that characterize big data sets. Lots of variety in the data, lots of volume, and velocity, meaning it's coming all the time. It never really stops. So think about this as a simple example. Imagine you're a grocery store retailer. Now, back in the day, if we were talking about analyzing marketing data then, uh, what we might expect is that we were going to get like a weekly report of sales figures from each of 100 grocery stores in the southeastern region, right? And when we look at these weekly sales figures, um, the sales results are all based on internal scanner data, right? The beep, 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 and the simple checkout receipts that are automatically uh, generated um, from the supermarket store. And now these results that we might be looking at in these weekly sales reports are broken down in by product category, maybe all the way down to like soup and maybe day of the week. And what I want to characterize about this type of data back then is notice that the uh, speed of the data right, is not very fast. It's coming weekly, not instantaneously. Uh, the data is not very um, fine. It's more coarse, right? It's, we can only break it down by product category and at the day of the week. And the volume level is relatively modest. Now, that same exact grocery store retailer who's working as an analyst or working with an analyst today, what might they expect if they're trying to look at this type of data? Um, we're on the right-hand side now. Well, now, they shouldn't be surprised if they have access to real-time data, right? Refreshed every five minutes of all the different sales that are occurring at each of those same 100 grocery stores. And these sales results are now based on internal scan scanner data. Again, still the same uh, SKUs being tracked by the scanners, but that data is also linked across customers' timelines, right? Because we have loyalty cards connecting them. And they're probably in this data that we're tracking is also probably augmented with customer profile data purchased from third party companies. For example, sure, now we know that this customer bought a six pack of sodas this week, but uh, two weeks ago they bought a six pack of beer. And because we bought access to third party uh, data merge, we also know that this person really loves fly fishing, right? And this is something that we wouldn't know about them just based on what we can observe directly through their grocery shopping habits. And in addition, we might expect that we actually have also partnered with other uh, data acquisition sources so that we actually know not only what our customers are buying with us, we might have some insights about what they're buying from our competitors and other stores. So if we were, say, a Whole Foods, we might actually know the types of products that the same customer is buying at, say, Albertsons. And if we're analyzing this data, we could probably break down these results to the exact time of purchase for the exact product, right? The exact specific iteration of the product, not just the overall category. We would know if any coupons or discounts were applied and so on. So again, it's just more of the data coming faster, greater in volume and coming from different sources. In fact, in the early 2010s, many companies that we think of today, really what they were pursuing is sort of, they thought there was their, their like strategic competitive advantage or sustainable competitive advantage, I, I should say, was based on the premise that they could collect big data, right? We think about the Ubers or Lyfts of the world. And one of the things that they uh, endeavored to do 
was use the fact that they had massive amounts of automatically generated data from their customers, drivers, people accepting or rejecting various offers for rides at different uh, costs. And they thought they could leverage that into a long-term competitive advantage based on their ability to not only collect big data, but utilize that big data. So if in the early 2010s, we really saw this surge of this term big data, but now that's kind of faded. And the reality of that is that now it's almost presumed for most organizations that big data is part of their life, right? They've gotten a little more custom to it. They've built out the, they've built out the infrastructure to actually collect or use this data. So it's, it no longer seems so big data, it just seems like data, like it's just what they're using. Um, but now we've noticed that there's kind of this uh, increase in the use of the term machine learning, right? And that, in, in terms of you know popular understanding, well, what is machine learning and why does it matter for us as marketers? Well, okay. Actually, there's a machine learning course uh, at Stanford. You can actually take it online for free if you want to learn basics of machine learning. Um, machine learning is simply the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. Now, in the past decade, machine learning has given us self-driving cars, practical speak rec speech recognition, effective web search, vastly improved understanding of the human genome, and so on and so on and so on. Machine learning is so pervasive today that you probably use it dozens of times a day without even knowing it. That's absolutely true. Um, with that in mind, so the idea is that machine learning is a way of getting computers to act without us actually programming explicitly how it behaves. I would like you to watch, you know, pause this video, and I want you to watch, if you don't mind, a six minute video of machine learning in action. And it comes from Seth Bling, his development of a machine learning algorithm that learns how to play Super Mario Brothers. I know this seems a little silly that I'm asking you to, to take a little pause at our introduction to marketing analytics here to watch someone describe machine learning applied to video games, but it's essential that we understand the general nature of machine learning before we can truly appreciate its opportunities in marketing. So while you watch this video, this short explainer, and boy, I really do like this video, uh, think about how the things that Seth Bling is describing obviously apply directly to a simple video game. But I want to see if you can think about how the things he's describing could also be applied more generally to maybe how marketers try to solve problems that they face. Right? So go ahead and hit that pause button and follow that link or you can search, just copy and paste or type in this a YouTube video and you'll find it right away. It's a very popular video. And I'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Okay, are you back? Did you enjoy the video? I hope so. I also suspect in many cases, some of the little details that were explained along the way were a bit unclear, right? If we're not super familiar with neural networks yet, that's entirely fine. I didn't want you to worry about the, you know, exactly what NEAT is, for example. But rather, I'm hoping that you noticed that what was going on in the video was a clear example of machine learning, right? We saw that essentially the algorithm was given a set of input, right? Controller buttons that it could press and the ability to detect sort of what it was seeing, air quotes, on the screen, right? Represented by those, you know, white dots and black dots. Then it was given a goal, right? Beat the Mario level in the minimum amount of time. In the video, it was described as maximizing the fitness, right? Which is a phrase used often in types of machine learning algorithm development. So notice that from the perspective of the person actually using the machine or developing the machine learning algorithm, this is all that the person developing the machine learning algorithm actually did, right? They let the algorithm know what it could use, the inputs, and it explicitly told it what its goal was and tried to achieve it and, it, and asked it to achieve as, uh, the best version of it as possible. But in the middle, actual algorithm getting built, like exactly what the set of math equations and what you're actually looking at here when you see a neural network is really just a complex interconnected set of math equations. Well, the person building the machine learning algorithm really didn't have much to say about how that specific set of internet connected equations should develop. That is what machine learning is, right? It tested out millions of different potential algorithms settling on the one that best achieved the goal. Ah, 
once we realize that the goal of the person developing the machine learning algorithm or endeavoring to use it, their only goals are to making sure to that they establish the inputs and articulate the goal. Of course, making sure all the data works and is connected and everything so that the algorithm can actually work is quite complicated. But we can see that machine learning has direct immediate applications for a wide variety of marketing decisions, right? Our inputs aren't really controller buttons. They're the common marketing inputs, the things that we think about when we're running a marketing campaign, right? The emails, our subject lines, how often to send them, what kind of coupons to put in them, social media posts, online ads, mailers, hey, whether or not we have a celebrity endorser, traditional TV commercials, radio ads, all these things, channels of distribution. In other words, the four Ps, right? The things that we can control to try to achieve our objectives. Those are our inputs as marketers. And then the goal, and of course we could articulate any goal, but maybe the most common type of goal is when we're analyzing a particular customer, our goal is to try to make sure that they have the highest potential long-term profitability for us, right? If we were BMW, it's not just that we want to sell a BMW to them once. We'd like to optimize our marketing mix in such a way that they become a customer for life. And, and if we do it perfectly well, we don't spend too much money on marketing inputs, right? It costs money to do those things, but yet we do them so well that it optimizes their long-term profitability. And that's exactly what we're talking about, where when we use a machine learning alg algorithm, it says, look, we're, we as humans cannot fathom how to build this interconnected set of math equations. But maybe if we set up the domain or the sandbox correctly for the algorithm to play in, maybe it can figure it out for us. So this is where machine learning has direct applications in, in marketing and why watching a video game about uh, Mario also has implications for us marketers. Of course, another thing that we'll be talking to uh, about a little more this semester is not just machine learning to build predictions, um, it's to actually generate things, right? And we'll talk quite a bit more about this uh, throughout the semester. Things like summarizing articles, right? Taking content and distilling it down. Uh, content marketers are obviously very interested in these types of things. So here's just one example from Salesforce. There's many others. Or actually building things like customer support chatbots. And we've seen some uh, recently some major innovations in this space where these types of chatbots um, may be difficult to say that they are great for customer experience, but their uh, efficacy has improved drastically in just the last few years. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those as well. But examples of machine lear learning algorithms also being deployed just to generate or interact rather than just predict. So now that we have a kind of a grasp of some of these terms, we can kind of see the interconnection between big data and machine learning and maybe understand why big data as sort of a popular term sort of came first in popular consciousness and then machine learning followed. Uh, big data is almost always what powers modern successful implementations of machine learning. You don't have to have giant piles of well-organized data to train an algorithm, but in, in other words, do machine learning, but almost every recent successful iteration of machine learning innovation has come from the fact that we've had massive amounts of data to marry to some of the theoretical advances in this space. So there's one last term that I haven't really taken the moment to describe just yet, and that's artificial intelligence. And why does it matter to marketing? And I saved this for last precisely because it's very hard to put your finger on exactly what uniquely defines artificial intelligence. Um, when I was actually looking through some of the recent literature, trying to understand like well, what exactly is AI, I've, I've noticed quite a few academics and people that have been working in this space for years, they actually admit it's very difficult to, in other words, they said, curiously, the lack of a precise, universally accepted definition of AI probably has helped the field to grow, blossom, and advance at an ever-accelerating pace. So they admit there's no good single definition, but it actually has been good for AI. How could that be? So here's the definition they came up with first. Artificial intelligence is that activity devoted to making machines intelligent. Hmm. And intelligence is that quality that enables an entity to function appropriately and with foresight in its environment. Sounds a bit like machine learning, doesn't it? Well, and here we go, uh, people reflecting on a hundred year study of artificial intelligence. We get to this understanding of why this lack of concise definition sort of is inevitable when we use the word AI. So they say, ironically, Artificial intelligence suffers the perennial fate of losing claim to its acquisitions. 
which uh, eventually and inevitably gets pulled inside the frontier, a repeating pattern known as the AI effect or the odd paradox. AI brings a new technology into the common fold, people become accustomed to the technology, and it stops being considered AI, and newer technology emerges. In other words, things like Alexa and voice activation. I mean, for a while there, we used the phrase artificial intelligence and imagined like, oh, are the machines becoming real? Are they becoming more and more intelligent? Now, that was very true in common parlance uh, uh, maybe a decade ago or a little less than a decade ago. But today, very few people, when they're shouting at Alexa, <laughs> do, they, do they feel as though that they are actually interact, interacting with an intelligent machine? So in other words, this sort of odd paradox, right? Those things that are pushed at the edge to make machines intelligent, well, once we just get accustomed to them, we're no longer impressed and we no longer think that they are really intelligence because we're always testing that against the idea of what we understand, at least what we think human intelligence is, right? Well, everybody, that was our brief introduction into the definition of marketing analytics and some of the common terms that we see floating around in this space of marketing analytics. I hope you notice that in many cases, there isn't a lockdown definition and it's ever evolving, right? So as we use and see these terms throughout the semester, I encourage you to keep reflecting on whether or not their uses in future weeks matches or contradicts, complements or challenges some of these ways that I've presented these definitions to you today. Further, I encourage you to check out other videos, uh, other websites online, or maybe even other textbooks or readings that you've uh, come across that might challenge or put pressure on some of the ways that I've defined these terms. I look forward to chatting with you in class and online, maybe understanding and developing our shared understanding of these ideas as we move forward throughout the semester. Take care.